Father, we come to you tonight, and uh, you've promised that you'd send your comforter, Lord, when you left, and you have. And, and we just pray that uh, we wouldn't ignore uh, the moving of your spirit in our lives in this place, that we would allow you to do that work that you want to do, Lord, and you want to reveal uh, God's Son to us. And so, Holy Spirit, may we be open to your moving. May we be open to what you want to say to our hearts to change us. Uh, we know that you haven't given us your word just so that we can memorize verses. It's so that our lives can be changed, uh, so that you would be glorified. So help us with it, Father. We, we need your help, and we look to you. And as we look for the help that you give, Lord, uh, the help comes from your comforter, your Holy Spirit. So fill this place, Lord, and uh, reveal yourself to us tonight. Anoint your word, Father, and uh, open our hearts to receive it. We just ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we got through the first 17 verses. Not quite through the chapter, I guess. Ugh. We might make it tonight. Uh, so he picks up in verse 18, and he says, For I reckon, or I account, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared uh, with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Notice it's in us. The, the glory that God has is going to be, be revealed in us as we go to be with him, as we go to realize all that he has for us. Uh, Paul says, I reckon or I account, just an accounting term, I put it on that side, uh, that, that the sufferings of this present time are not to be worthy with the glory that's going to be revealed. And, and boy, what a, what a hope and what a, a sureness that is that the Lord gives to us, uh, that uh, the things that are here now, the trials that are here as we enter into the sufferings of Christ, as we realize all the things that are against us, the world, the flesh, the devil, uh, all those things that come against us, that none of those things are, are going to matter as we see the glory of God revealed in our lives as we go to heaven. And boy, that's going to be such a wonderful place to be, a wonderful time as we realize that uh, all these things that are going on now, all these things that have happened, all the hurts, uh, all the discouragements, all the failures, all those things uh, are, are just going to diminish in the glory of God as he reveals it through us. And boy, sometimes we need that encouragement that even though we failed, even though there's discouragements, even though there's hurts, that God is going to reveal glory in us later on. Uh, and it's coming. Uh, for some of us, we hold on to those hurts so often that uh, he wants some of that glory revealed now as he changes our hearts and changes our lives. And, and certainly we want to be open to that. And that's one of the things the Holy Spirit does. And we're going to see seven things tonight, hopefully, if we get that far, uh, that the Holy Spirit does in this chapter for us. Uh, and one of those things is just to take away the past and, and remove it and put freshness in our lives, put a zeal in, in a in a a revelation of who God is so that we can go on. Because sometimes, let's face it, uh, we're all humans, we're in this flesh, and sometimes we just don't want to go on. We get news, we get uh, information, we get things that come into our lives, and, and it's hard for us just to press forward. Uh, but that's the thing that God wants for us. Uh, and this is one of those encouragements that he gives us, that there's going to be glory revealed in us, in that uh, the things that are going on now don't have to weigh us down, don't have to keep us under, that we can rise above those things. And uh, it's just so wonderful to have those promises and those that encouragement that the Lord brings in this. Uh, I account that the sufferings are not worthy to be compared as he puts them on the balances and realizes that the glory is going to far outshine anything of suffering that we're going through at this present time. He says, For the earnest expectation of the creature or the creation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Uh, th there's an earnest, uh, that's a down payment, the, the expectation that, that's waiting for us, uh, that, that we're going to have that fellowship with God, we're going to be in that place where we can have uh, all that God has for us and that it's going to be revealed to us. It tells us this in, in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 12. Uh, he says this, 
if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abides faithful. Even if we can't believe, he still is abiding faithful in those things that are still going to come to pass. And those things are going to be glorious in our lives. Uh, and he says this in Second Corinthians 4, verse 16. Uh, just such a wonderful encouragement. So he, he says, for which cause we faint not. And sometimes we're in that place of fainting. <laughs> which cause we faint not, but through our outward, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And that's one of the encouragements the Lord wants to bring to the body of Christ, that even though things look terrible, even though things look awful, the inward man is changing if we allow the Holy Spirit to change us, if we allow him to come in and just encourage us and strengthen us for the battles that are here. We see Israel and Hamas fighting, and we realize it's, it's more than just a physical battle. There's a spiritual battle going on, uh, and it's going on all over the world. The bill was praying uh, before uh, service started, uh, that uh, just all the things that are happening and all the awfulness that's there, uh, and yet God wants his, he has his people, and he's going to minister to them and, and protect them and keep them, and that's what we want. But that's also what God says. And, and it's, so it's not going by our feelings, it's going by the truth of God's word. And if God says, I want to raise you up above the situations that you're in, if I, if I want to raise you up and, and, and give you more glory in your life, that glory sometimes has to come through persecutions and trials and tribulations. And through those trials, we see that God is faithful. Through those situations, we see that God is able to keep us moving day after day after day through the hard things that are going on. And he wants to do that in our lives. He wants to raise us up especially in the days that we're in, uh, because we're here as image bearers of who God is, and we're supposed to be image bearers in that place of giving hope to a world that's lost and dying, and there's darkness all around. But where there's more darkness, the light shines brighter. And so just let yourself be cracked vessels, <laughs> those, those broken pots that just let the light shine through, because we are broken. When God's hand is upon us in those trials and when God's hand just reveals those things through us that we can trust him, his light shines through just a little bit more. But a lot of times it takes brokenness in our lives for us to get to that place where we can shine even more. God, you said that you weren't going to leave me or forsake me. So, Lord, in my desperate time right now, Father, be glorified and let your glory shine through so that others can see and know that there's a God that's sustaining me during these days. Ah, the sufferings of this present time, and there certainly is sufferings going on all over. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory. We see the awfulness. Uh, uh, just got a newsletter today from Far Reaching Ministries, uh, uh, which I didn't put out the new one because it's just awful. The description and the graphics are just terrible. Uh, but but just all the stuff that goes on in the world, and we're just hearing about little things here and there. But just think of all the things that are going on behind closed doors, even in America, in the darkness, the adultery, the fornication, the abuse, the abuse of kids, the killing of children, just the awfulness that's there, the sufferings that are there for all of them, and the trauma that's going, that they're going to have. God wants to raise us up above that. He said this earnest expectation, and aren't you waiting for Jesus to come? <laughs> come quickly, Lord Jesus, for the earnest expectation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature, the creation, was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature, the creation, sometimes used interchangeably, uh, itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Because remember, this earth was delivered over to the curse of sin also. In one day, that's going to be redeemed also. These vessels are going to be redeemed. The earth is going to be redeemed. And we're going to come back and rule and reign with Jesus for a thousand years. And this is Jesus returns it to its rightful place, to its rightful being. And boy, isn't it going to be great to see? Oh, 
It's going to be delivered from the bondage of corruption. And that's what we see all around us is that that corruption and its bondage. There's no freedom in that. There's no hope in that. There's there's no flavor in that of of any kind of peace or, or sanctification. It's all just corruption. But instead of that corruption that we see now, we're going to see the glorious liberty of the children of God. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to set his kids free. He wants to set you and I free from the things that hold us down, from the things that hurt us. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Uh, even way back in Genesis, we see that the the earth was given over uh, to those things and the whole creation groaneth. Not just us, but the whole creation groaning. As we see the uh, the earthquakes and all the things that are happening, just the, the creation groaning, the noises that are going on, that are rising up to heaven as he hears the groaning that's going on. And God pays attention, not only to the groaning of the earth, but to the groaning that's in our hearts too. And that's another thing that the Holy Spirit does for us. He interprets our groanings to the throne of God. Oh as he hears the groans of our hearts. Because sometimes when we, we try and pray, the only thing that we can do is groan because those things overwhelm us so much. But church, we need to rise up above those things. And if we can't, then the Holy Spirit interprets those to the Father, and the Father hears and he answers. He answers even those cries. Such a wonderful Father we have in heaven. And not only they, but ourselves also, verse 23, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. <laughs> uh, and this isn't the groaning that you get when you try and get up out of a chair or when you try and roll out of bed and stand up. Uh, th- th- these are real groanings that you don't know what to say, and so you just groan. The groanings within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. He's going to adopt us into the family of God. We're going to be image bearers of who he is. As children are adopted into families, they take on the name, they take on the characteristics of the family that they're adopted into. And that's what we're to do. And that's what is going to happen with us. We're going to be image bearers. We're going to have those new bodies Uh, We're going to have those new minds that are going to be in heavenly places just worshiping before the throne together. But we're groaning within ourselves, waiting for the rapture of the church, waiting for the church to be taken out, waiting for us to go home to be with him in heaven. And he says, to wit, the redemption of our body, the redeeming of our body. And this isn't just an I hope so. This is something that we can know, that we are going to be redeemed that we have been redeemed and we're just waiting for that final act to take place god sees us it tells us in scripture sitting in heavenly places in christ jesus he already sees the finished work he's just waiting for that final act whoa to be completed there i go smacking the thing again uh that's going to sound good on the tape isn't it? <laughs> tapes i just dated myself again we're out of tapes uh to be redeemed, to be in that place where, where these failures and these failings of our body, as our bodies fall apart, as our minds fall apart, as our hearts just give over to the things of the flesh, they're all going to be redeemed and changed one day. The failures and the hurts and the pains are going to be gone. No more sorrow, no more pain, all the tears wiped away. You know, oh, is that going to be sweet? And we'll be together in it. Get used to each other. You'll have on different clothes, but we're all going to be together. We'll know who we are. (laughs) For for we are saved by hope. Uh, And this isn't, and I hope so, like a lot of people believe, are you going to heaven? I hope so. We can know. If we're born again of the Spirit, if we're walking with Christ, if we believe that Jesus was the Son of God, that he came and died on the cross for our sins, shed his blood for the covering of our sins, uh, and we believe that that redemption is for you and I, that he took our place on the cross to take care of our sin, that payment that we owe that we couldn't pay. If we believe that, if we trust that, then we have a sure hope, Scripture tells us. Not just an I hope so, but it's a reality that's coming to every believer on this earth. The ones in Iran, the ones in Iraq, the ones in Afghanistan, 
the ones in America, we're all going to rise and we're going to be with him. We are saved by hope. And that salvation, remember the salvation is in three parts. Salvation from the past. All the sins of the past have been taken care of. The sins of the present have been taken care of. And that final part of salvation, when our bodies are redeemed and we're out of that, those temples that, that are subject to the flesh and we're in heavenly bodies before him forever. That's the final act of salvation. We are saved by hope. But he says, but hope that is seen isn't hope. It's not really hope. I hope that I can get that new bike that I see in front of me. That isn't a hope. (laughs) That's just something to indulge our flesh while we're here. Uh, Because it tells us in, in Hebrews. Well, hold your place here. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. And we'll read it because we'll, we'll see what it is for sure. Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, as he digs into it, he says here in verse 24, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why, why does he yet hope? If he already sees it, you can't really hope for it. Because this is what it says in Hebrews 11 about, about that hope, that faith that we have. Now faith it says, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report, that they walked by faith, they walked in faith. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. <laughs> and then they go through the whole list of peoples that believe by faith, that walk by faith. And you know what? In heavenly places, I think there's a longer list, and our names are on those lists because we believe God by faith. You believe in a God that you can't see. You believe that one day we're going to be raptured out of this earth and go to heaven. And if we believe that God is able to do that, and if we believe that God made this world by a word, then why can't we believe that God can take care of our hurts and our pains right now? God, can you take care of the diseases that are in me? Those are things hoped for. We haven't seen the final result, but it's coming. And by faith, we trust it. And it says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we as Christians don't walk by sight anymore, or as much, we walk by faith. And one day, he wants us to walk more and more by faith and less and less by what we see. Because when things are all right, when things are perfect in our little worlds, we really don't have to have faith in anything. <laughs> but when things are hard, we, we come up with all kinds of things to hope for, of things to lean on, of things to trust in. But God wants us to do that all the way through, not just with the big things in our life, but with everything. Lord, where do I go today? How do I get through the day walking in the Spirit, walking with you and trusting you? Mm. This is an everyday thing. Faith is not just a one-time thing that, that says, I trust in Jesus, and now I have perfect faith. This is a day-by-day trusting Jesus that he's going to get me through today and bring me out on the other side. Lord, even if something bad happens to me, Lord, you're still with me. I trust you in that. And if I trust you in that, I'm walking by faith. And not by what I see. Because, Lord, around me, everything is awful. But, Lord, you're still wonderful. (laughs) You created this world. You created my body that when I go to sleep at night, I'm not worried if I'm still going to be breathing halfway through the night. I trust you in the midst of it, Lord. And, Father, I trust you that even my snoring isn't going to wake up my wife. Lord, I, I can trust you that all the way through, you're going to take care of every part of everything that goes on. I'm trusting you with my car. I'm trusting you with the way that I walk. I'm trusting you with my knees that are falling apart. I'm trusting you with my back that gives out on me. I'm trusting you with my thoughts that that I need you in the midst of it. I'm trusting you to take care of me. And he will. And that's one of the things of the Holy Spirit. He's going to bring those things to remembrance, and he's going to show us the best ways to be close to God, to walk in the truth of God, so that we can always know his presence and always know his sustaining love and grace in the midst. How else can we explain people like Elijah that would just cry out to God and have those things happen? As he sat on the mountain and the captain of 50 men come up to the mountain, 
And he says, if you're, if, if I'm really a man of God, then fire's going to come down out of heaven and consume you. And poof, whoa. It was still from God. It wasn't for from Elijah. It was God honoring his man at the moment. And I don't think God wants to do that for all of us because we're so busy in the flesh that we'll call down fire from heaven for the people in the car in front of us that just cut us off. <laughs> Poof, just evaporate that car, Lord. Just get. We want it to be for his glory, for his ways, and not ours. And Elijah was in that place because he was walking by faith. Lord, I trust you. How else could our prophets say the things that they said and have them come to pass unless God's spirit was working in and through them to give them all that they needed for their daily life? And if he can do that for them, why can't he do it for you? Mm, He can, and he wants to, and he does. We just have to apprehend it and grab a hold of it. And so back in, in Romans here, uh, it says we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not real hope. Uh, for what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for it? <laughs> it's already there. But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? Lord, I don't know how it's going to come to pass, but I'm trusting you that it's going to come to pass, that you're going to do that work, you're going to complete that good work that you've begun And so it says, likewise, in verse 26, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. (laughs) Thank you, Lord, because our infirmities need some help. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And this is just so wonderful. It's God's will that the Spirit, and it even tells us later on that Jesus daily intercedes for us. It's the will of God that the Spirit and Jesus would intercede for you and I. Oh, Lord, I need prayer. He goes, I'm praying for you. Oh, Lord, I need more prayer. I'm praying for you. Mm. And there's nobody better to pray for you than God himself. And if he's praying for you, you've got the best prayers going. And he knows what to give you. We just need to be in that place of receiving what he has for us and being able to understand that even though things don't look the way that we want them to look, that he's still involved, he's still praying, and he's still acting on our behalf. Can you imagine poor Elijah (laughs) walking through the desert and ravens? Here's a prophet of God. And ravens, which are dirty birds. I mean, I hate ravens. Ah, They're noisy, they're obnoxious, they're mean. And yet, who's bringing Elijah food? The raven. And yet he, by faith, took it as nourishment from the Lord. And it sustained him for 40 days. Ah, We don't understand the means sometimes, but we like the results. Lord, I want to not only know your miracles, but I want to know you behind the miracle. Like it says in the Psalms with Moses, that Moses knew the ways of God. The people saw his miracles, but Moses knew the ways of God. He went a little deeper than the people did. And for you and I, God is calling us to a deeper walk. He's calling us to a deeper place. And and please pray for me in that. I want to go deeper, but sometimes it scares me to pieces. Lord, what is going to (laughs) happen? And it does, does it? Because our flesh always wants to go the opposite way and say, well, it's going to be a bad thing that happens. Why? It doesn't have to be a bad thing. Let's see. Being filled with the presence of the Lord, knowing his ways, seeing his miracles, walking in the truth of his word, standing on his promises, and and we go, well, that could be a bad thing. (laughs) Oh, But what better place is there to be than in that place? That's the best place for us to be. And so uh, I'll pray for you. You pray for me that we could just go deeper with the Lord. And I think the days that we're coming to, the days that we're in, we're going to need that deeper walk. We may not always be able to meet like this, but the world and legislation can never stop us from meeting with our Lord in heaven. They can stop this building, but they can't stop his presence in our lives. Never, never, never. Iran, the people in Iran, the Khomeini, can't stop the people that are over there getting saved right now. 
from walking in truth. But will threaten you with death. Okay, threaten me with going home. <laughs> As one of the guys that, that we used to fellowship with said, don't threaten me with heaven. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, but he says this, likewise, the spirit helps our infirmities. Those things that are infirmities to us, God is able to take care of. Lord, I can't pray. Lord, I can't trust you right now. Lord, I'm weak right now. In, in infirmities, really, in, in, in Scripture means the, the weaknesses that are there, the weaknesses that are in our bodies, that are in our minds, in our hearts. Those weaknesses, the spirit is helping those weaknesses. Lord, I'm weak, but when I'm weak, then you're strong. See, that's, that's what happens with the Word when the Word comes in. We trust the Word, and we stand on the Word. Lord, I don't see it, but I'm walking by faith that you're helping my infirmity, and I'm trusting you because you said you were going to be strong if I'm weak. So, Lord, I'm weak. Help me. And he wants to, and he does. How else do any of us make it through any of the things that have happened in our lives. We've all suffered in one way or another things that we really never wanted to have happen. But who got us through? It wasn't our strength. It was God's strength getting us through and bringing us to the end of ourselves so that his glory could be seen. It says, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth, What is the mind of the Spirit? Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. It's God's will that they would be praying for us. And he says, and we know in in this scripture, we all know, and we know. But the question I think for us tonight is, it says that we know that all things work together for good to them that that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. But do we really know? that God is going to work all those things to the good. God, are you really? It doesn't look like it with my eyesight. He says, well, walk by faith and not by sight. And if you walk by faith, if you have eyes of faith, you can see the results that are coming. It's growing you in grace. It's growing you in the knowledge of who God is. And what could be more glorious than that? Sometimes those infirmities, our weaknesses, and those trials that are around us, those afflictions that are there, are to get us to a place of realizing that God is working in spite of us. Uh, We know without a shadow of a doubt that all things... And don't we give these scriptures out to everybody that cries out to us and calls us on the phones and says, I'm in trouble and I don't know what to do. Well, God works all things to the good until it happens to us. (laughs) And then we go, help, because I have no clue what to say. And instead of going back to the scriptures that we give out, we're, we're at a loss unless those things are written on the tables of our heart and we trust those things by faith for us even, as well as for everybody else. We know without a doubt that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purposes. Well, Lord, sometimes I don't know what that good is. And we may never know some of those times what that good is. We were talking before and uh, we've got a, another great-grandchild on the way, uh, but we lost one of, a couple of years ago, uh, and people kept asking us, what is the good in this? He died just before he turned three, uh, and what good is going to come from that? And the only good that I can see right now is that it saves this young boy from a life of destruction because of the parents that certainly weren't going to be parents And I think the Lord saved him and spared him and is now in glory with him. And that's the good that I see out of it. And it may not look good because we lost a little one, but he's in glory ahead of me. And for some reason, that isn't fair. (laughs) I should be there first, not him. But he's there waiting. And it's just sweet to know I've got somebody waiting that I haven't seen for a while that I'm going to see again. Oh, Sometimes things around us don't look good. But God is working good, and he's going to show your heart what those are. It may take a while, but he's going to bring you through. Trust him. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did not foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. If he knows us and he knows what is going to happen to us, then he's 
conformed us to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. (laughs) And isn't that all that's going on from Genesis to Revelation? He's calling people, he's conforming them, he's justifying them, and he's going to glorify them. The whole gospel, the whole good news of what God is doing in the world and through the world is found right there. Just such a glorious thing. What shall we say then in verse 31 to these things? If God be for us, then who can be against us? Oh, and stand on it. God, you're for me. And if you're for me, you're going to do those things that are good for me and you're going to do those things that are right for me. I remember when I was little, mom took me to the grocery store uh, and walking down the aisle, saw Lifesavers. You know, the five flavor jabbers uh, that that were in there, not just the peppermint or the wintergreen, but the five flavors. You know, you get them all, the cherry and and all those flavors. And I grabbed a pack, got home, and Mom saw them, and she goes, where'd you get those? Uh, uh." And what do you say, you know? You lie through your teeth is what you do. But she already knows you're lying. (laughs) She already knows where you got them from. So what did she do? She took me back to the grocery store. I go, you're going to work all things to the good? This isn't good. What's the good coming out of it? The good coming out of it is I never did that at the grocery store again. (laughs) It changed me. And trials and afflictions and things that happen sometimes do that. And even the things we do against God, he's going to work those to the good as we're going to see that they're going to be good for us later on. They may not feel good right now, but they're going to be good for us spiritually in the end. And one day, one moment, we're going to be glorified in his midst. So there's really seven things uh, that the the Holy Spirit helps us with uh, before we finish up the chapter here. Let's just get those. In verse 2 of this chapter, we see the first one is, is that he frees us. There's freedom. It says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So the help of the Holy Spirit is to show us the freedom that we have in Christ. The second one then is in verse 11. Uh, it shows us the strength that we can have to serve. It says, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make you alive by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So as he dwells in us, he gives us strength to be alive. The strength that we need right now to be alive and to show the world that we're alive, even though things around us are trying to kill us. The third thing then in verse 13 is that we have victory over sin. It says, for if we live after the flesh, we're going to die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the, the deeds of the body, you're going to live. So the third thing he does is he shows us that we can have victory over sin. And then the fourth thing, that he's going to guide us, and he shows us his guiding ways in, in verse 14. It says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, there's the leading that we're looking for. Isn't it amazing that it tells us in, in Scripture in the Old Testament that God led his people out of, out of Egypt, out of the world, and towards the Promised Land? It tells us in Psalm 23, and Jesus tells us that he's the good shepherd that leads us. And what does it say here? The Holy Spirit leads us. All of the Godhead is involved in leading you in the right way for your life and in your life so that you can have real life. He's leading us towards that place. And sometimes we stop at springs that are a little salty and they hurt a little bit and in some places that look poisonous and some places that look barren. And yet he leads us through those things, doesn't he? And always brings us to good pasture so that we can eat the best that we have. So he's guiding us. Hmm. The the fifth thing then is that we can witness of his sonship in verse 16. And the spirit also, or the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We witness sonship in it because the Holy Spirit shows us that we truly are his kids 
but you need to know the Lord in the midst of that. We can't believe that in our flesh. It can only be a work of the Spirit that God can minister that to our hearts and change our hearts to believe something like that. God, I'm your child. The way that I look, I'm not a black sheep anymore. (laughs) I'm your child, and you love me in spite of the way that I look, in spite of my fears, in spite of my giving up at times, in, in spite of my just surrendering to the work of the flesh and getting mad at everything that's going on, you still love me? <clears throat> the sixth thing then in, in verse 26 is that he helps us in service. Likewise also, the Spirit also helpeth. There it is. Helps that in the King James, it's the E-T-H, which is an ongoing verb. So he helps and he continues to help. He's helping you before to get rid of sin. He's helping you right now to be encouraged in the walk that you're in, that you can make it, that you can get through this day. And then the eighth thing uh, is in the next verse. He helps us in prayers. Uh, Or verse 26 again, For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself helps us with that. That's part of our infirmity, isn't it? We don't know what to do. We don't know how to pray. And that's what the Lord wants to teach us is how to pray, not to bring him a grocery list, but to really pray. Some of the old pastors used to say, well, let's pray and still, until we really start praying. Let's not just pray our grocery lists. Let's pray for God to work in our lives. Because real prayer is just getting real with God. Lord, this is who I am and I need you. It isn't save Aunt Margaret and help Uncle Harry and uh, get rid of this bozo in my life and get rid of that in my life and do this the real prayer is lord i want to be more like you and i have no idea how to get there and the holy spirit loves those prayers and jesus loves those prayers and god the father hears those prayers and he answers those prayers and look at where you've come from you've come from a place of complete unbelief that there even was a god and you've got bibles in your hand and you've got notes in your bibles Would you ever do that before you got saved? Look at how far he's brought you already. And you think, God, you're not working at all. Look at what he's done already. (laughs) Amazing work if we let God. And so now he comes to this place in verse 31. uh, Is the Lord, as we see uh, how much the Holy Spirit is involved in our lives, he then brings up these seven questions in these next few verses uh, of what people are going to say or, or or whatever is going to happen as we doubt, as we come to that place uh, of saying, but but what if, but what if, and we all have those, and the Lord even deals with those. And in verse 31, he says, what shall we then say to these things? What are we going to say about these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? <laughs> if God is for us, then is our flesh bigger than our God? Is our government rules and regulations bigger than our God? Is Islam bigger than our God? Is Dagon bigger than our God? Hmm. And we know the answer is no. <clears throat> then why do we sit here and say, God, I know that you can't do that in my life. Hmm. Or you probably don't want to. Why would God not want to give you something good in your life? Oh, if God is for us, Who really can be against us? We know who. Scripture tells us, the world, the flesh, the devil. (laughs) But who's bigger than all those put together? Our God. Our God is bigger and better than all those things. And we know that all those things are going to work together for the good because our God is bigger than better and he's not against us. In verse 32 then he said, He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If he he didn't spare his own son, why isn't he freely going to give us everything that we need for life and godliness? And yet we doubt him sometimes, don't we? Lord, you're not giving me what I need. Instead of walking by faith, we're walking by sight. I don't see it in my life, therefore it's not happening, therefore God, you can't. Hmm. But he is. We're just not walking by faith and looking with eyes of faith to see what he's doing for us and in us and through us. It's interesting. Uh, 
we don't have time for it now because otherwise we'll never make it through. Even though I got an extra hour here, <laughs> we still won't make it. Uh, uh, but this word spared here is has the same meaning of the word. Uh, remember when Abraham took Isaac up to the mountain and he didn't withhold his son from the Lord? It says that uh, in, in chapter 22 of Genesis, that word withheld is the same word that this word spared is interpreted to be. Abraham did not withhold his son. He gave him to the Lord completely. And it says here, he that spared not his own son, as God did not spare his only son, Jesus. He didn't spare him. Mm. Isn't it amazing that he didn't spare his own son, but who did he spare? Sinners like you and I. Oh, he gave his only son, but spared us. Amazing God that we serve. His ways certainly aren't our ways, because we, we would definitely spare the good ones and get rid of the bad ones, wouldn't we? Mm. But what did he do? He didn't spare the good one, but spared every bad one that was there, because all of us were at enmity with God, Scripture says. And yet he spared us. Can you believe that? If you can, then you can believe that God loves you and that God is taking care of you, and he's getting you through today, and he's going to get you through tomorrow. <laughs> oh, who then, in verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. And who lays anything to the charge of God's elect? Satan, the world, the flesh. <laughs> But God, it says, justifies us, just as if we had never sinned. As Satan comes up and says, this person is a sinner, and Jesus stands up and goes, what sin? It's covered in the blood. And God says, I don't see any sin. Oh, amazing. And we're going to get to take communion tonight. What perfect timing. I wonder who worked all that out. That's why we didn't get through Romans 8 last week. <laughs> uh, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again. He didn't just die. We, we can't stop there that he died. He's risen again. For believers, Jesus is not dead. He's not still on the cross, hanging limp on the cross because his life is out of him. He is alive, and he's alive and working for you and me, daily interceding for us, daily working for us, daily bringing us to remembrance that he loves us and how much he's loved us and daily reminding us that he is able to take care of us. <laughs> he that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. There he is. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, Jesus, both making intercession for us. So then who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And we sang that tonight, didn't we? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril, peril or sword? And we go through, guess what, folks? As you read that list, you're going to go through every one of those in one way or another. And it's not so that you'll be destroyed. It's not so that you'll give up and say, I can't do this anymore. I quit. It's so God can show you that he can. When we're weak, he helps our infirmities. He helps our weakness. So that we can get through none of those things is going to separate us from the love of christ not one of those things as it is written for thy sake we are killed all the day long we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter nay in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us notice it's past tense he's already loved us he loved you from before the foundation of the world it says in Revelation 13, that Jesus then made up his mind to take upon himself the sin of the world and to die for sin. He's already loved you. He can't love you any more than he already does because it's perfect, it's complete, and it's in him. But notice the first part of verse 37, in all. Do something with that word. I know it's short. <laughs> I'm good at short words. Circle it. Do something with it. All those things, we are more than conquerors. Do you feel like a conqueror or do you feel conquered? <laughs> we do feel conquered sometimes, don't we? But the truth of the matter is that we're more than conquerors. He's already defeated those things for us. 
<clears throat> for I am persuaded as Paul brings that through. And I think one of those those things that he says there and really what that word persuaded means is to have confidence. I'm now not only persuaded, but I have confidence in this that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, which is what we talked about before. They can't legislate God's love to stop from coming to you and me. They can put us away. They can put us in solitary. They can hide us. They can do all kinds of things to us, but they can't take the love of Christ away from us. That love is going to minister to us even in the midst. And the truth of that, one of the greatest examples of that is is Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail as they were singing hymns at midnight. Who broke through the jail doors and set them free? The Lord. (laughs) Jails can't keep God out. Do you feel in bondage? That bondage can't keep God from loving you and from showing you how much he loves you. Circumstances can't keep God's love from showing you that he loves you and that he's taking care of you and that he's walking with you. It may not feel like it, but are you walking by sight or are you walking by faith? Lord, help. And as we come to that place of of just seeing God's goodness and God's grace, uh, we are just amazed at all that he does. He brings about all those questions that come to us, doesn't he? So if we're struggling with anything tonight, uh, we're going to take communion and just spend a minute just sitting before the Lord and just having him speak to our hearts. What is it that's there that's making you not trust me? If I've died for you and I'm risen again, what can I do in your life? Can I bring you through everything that's in front of you right now? And so, Father, as we prepare our hearts to take communion, uh, just speak to us, Lord. It tells us your Spirit's going to help us, that he's praying for us, that he's going to witness to us, that he's going to show us all of the things that are involved in in our mortal beings that we don't even know about. And he's going to be faithful to do it in the way that brings glory to you, that shows us we're justified before you. And so, Father, as we sit before you, May you minister to our hearts and just reveal to us just how great a love you have for us and that we can go on. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Minister to our hearts now, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, just thank you for your presence. Thank you for the working of your spirit, Lord. Thank you for ministering to our hearts tonight and just speaking to us in the places that we are, the vessels that we are, 
the things that are going on in our lives, Lord, that you want to minister to each and every one of them. And we thank you that it's by your power. And your word tells us by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, we're going to be raised from the dead, Lord. And we're going to be quickened to be made alive forevermore. And so, Father, we we thank you for the work of the cross. We thank you for the result of those workings, Lord, that we can have forgiveness of sin, that we can have the promise of eternal life, and that we can walk in that truth. So help us, Lord, in the midst. We hold in our hands the bread just representing your body that was broken. We hold in these cups the juice that just represents your blood that was poured out for each and every one of our sins. There's not a sin that can't be forgiven. And so thank you, Lord, that you, a perfect being, came and died for my sin because I couldn't pay the price. Thank you, Lord, that you did and that you were willing. And if we can trust you with forgiveness, we can certainly trust you with every other thing, Lord, that comes through. So strengthen us tonight, Lord. Minister to us. Refresh us. And we give you thanks and glory and honor because you alone are worthy. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake.